Okay, shoes off. What about painful? That painful? Ooh, that's also good. I'll also accept that. And your skin crawl right out of your shoes? Okay. Anyways. Uh, okay, so we were talking about a lot to cover. I think we'll be able to get through uh, most of the stuff in this section, probably today, maybe Monday. Uh, so I want to keep going where we were at. So we were talking about format string vulnerabilities. So what is the essence of a format string vulnerability? Say louder. More specifically, when do you know a printf vulnerability can occur or exist in a piece of code? Whenever a user input can influence or control any of the values inside the format string, fundamentally at that point you can then overload the printf function by changing that format string to make the function think that more arguments are popped off the stack than actually are. So, to refresh our memories, we are looking at a simple vulnerable program which has an int main, uh, it opens a file called temp log. It then passes that to a function called add log, which has a, a buffer of a line of 65, I believe, thousand bytes, which then has local variables in i and result, and there's a while one, and basically read one byte from the file, or from zero, so what's zero? Uh, standard. standard input, so read one byte from standard input into this uh, line buffer. Then if the result is zero, is zero exit, which means that we're end a file. Otherwise, the increment i. Uh, if we've reached the end of the buffer, then exit. And if the last thing we read was a new line, then exit this loop as well. So this will read in until it gets to end of file or it gets to the new line character. We'll keep just reading in bytes. So custom input routine. We went through this, and if you step through this, you can guarantee that there's no possible overflow at the most number of bytes that will be read is 65536, which is the size of the buffer, which means there's no overflow and no off by one errors, we hope. But then we get to this point where we make an F printf, and we're passing in F the file, which was open in main of temp log, and we're passing in line, which we just read in from the input. Right? This is a standard thing that we would write, but just write out that input we got to a log file, right? Because we want to store the logs for later analysis. But here, the problem is that where does the bytes in line come from? Standard input. Where does standard input come from? The user. So the user can put whatever bytes they want, including percent ends, percent exits, percent whatever. So we demonstrated this with an input where we passed into the program four A's, four B's, four C's, four D's, followed by eight percent P's, and we saw that it actually, well, it output four A's, four B's, four C's, four D's, which is exactly what a printf does when it's going through a format string, and it sees A, 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 B, 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 C, C, C. But then when it got to the first percent D, it, it printed out OX1. What is this OX1? The value of i, yeah, we drew the stack and we looked and saw that now those percent p's are essentially reading values off the stack starting, what was it, I believe an EVP plus 12 because it's the f, the f parameter and then line, so it's at EVP plus 8, 12, 16, at EVP plus 18, uh, 16, sorry, from the perspective of the f printf function. So it's when this f printf is called and what's passed to it is f and line. So basically all of those stack values above where line is pushed onto the stack are being read out. So we saw the percent, the hex one, which is, we saw is the int i on the stack. So what's this next thing? What's this hex 41, 41, 41, 41? It's a, capital A. That's four capital A's. But what is that? Starting. 
That's the start of the line buffer on the stack. Because we know we just copied four A's up there. And then above that, we copied four B's and then four C's. And so when print F is printing up the stack, the second percent P gives us 41, 41, 41, 41. The second one gives 42, 42, 42, which is capital B, four capital B's. The next one is four C's, then four D's. And then we get to 70, 25, 70, 25, which if we decoded that would be percent P. So we're actually reading from our string here. Um, and so you can test this uh, to look at that. And then, so, so this means that we essentially control the bytes at which how many percent P's, like how many bytes, of, how many percent P's of the stack do we start controlling those bytes that is printed by the format string? So do we control that first percent P output? Kind of. I mean, it's our name. It's I, which is the number of lines, I believe. But, you know, whatever. But that's hard to control a number. What about the next P, percent P? Yeah. So we can completely control it. If we change those four A's to whatever we want, we can put whatever value we want there on the stack. What values can't we put on the stack? Any address. It's the alternative. So, yeah, we can't. Uh, we may actually, if we go back. Is the standard input? I believe we could, I think read will read in null bytes. So we could put null bytes in there. What can't we put? New line. New line. It's a new line character. It's going to break. So we can't have new line characters in there. Are there any other restrictions? No, so we can change, we can completely control those four bytes. So what would happen if I changed the second percent P to a percent N? What would happen? Right to whatever the address is in. Yeah, so in this example, if I just changed the second, if I did, instead of this percent P times eight, I did percent P and then percent N, what's gonna happen? Yeah, how many is it going to write? So it's going to write, there's 16, four, four A's, four B's, four C's, four D's, plus zero X1, so an additional three. And then it's going to write out to memory address 41, 41, 41, 41, which is probably going to do what? Sec. Sec fault, because that memory location is not allocated to our program. So would we give up, go home? No. What do we do? Yeah, let's put an address on there, right? We can change those four A's to be whatever bytes we want. The question is, okay, so now we can, we can put whatever address we want, but the question is then, what do we want to overwrite? So what are we used to overwriting on a buffer overflow? The IP. Right, the save the IP. Do you know exactly the address of the save the IP that you're overwriting? Do you need to know that in order to overwrite it? No, why not? Do you mean the location of the EIP? Or do you yes. Uh, I mean, where? what is the exact memory location? So for instance, if you want to overwrite the save the IP of uh, what's the do log function that we had, what, what, what would you change these four A's to to overwrite that value? And do you have to think about that when you're doing buffer overflow? Buffer overflows are relative, right? They start at a fixed memory location of the buffer and they go up, so it's a relative offset. So you actually don't, you need to know what value to overwrite to go to your shell code, but fundamentally it's a relative offset. Like here, is this a relative write? Oh, it's absolute. It's going to act right to whatever memory location we put in for those four A's. It will write, we'll see whatever bytes we want to choose. So what do we want to overwrite? Do we want to go back here and try to guess what the, e, the save the IP is on the stack of add log? 
how correct do we have to be? Like 100% correct, right? We have to overwrite exactly those four bytes as they exist on the stack in exactly that memory location that they are. As we know, we're not dealing with ASLR and all of our things, so we could do that, but if anything changes, right? Whereas when we're doing our shell code, we, have, we do have to write the address of our shell code with the not sled, we have more of a leeway, right? We can give ourselves additional space with the not sled, so we don't have to be quite precise in what we overwrite. And, sorry, the value that we overwrite on EIP. So, then, the question is, what then can we overwrite? Right? Well, we talked about several things, and one thing that we can do is we know that the global offset table in the program contains the addresses of all the locations of all the functions used in libc or any other libraries from that code. So we can use readelf, the readelf program with dash dash reloads. I think object nouns has something similar to dash lowercase r, I don't remember. So we can look at the relocation table that will print us out the global offset table. So this will say, uh, if you do that, you will have and you can actually get really in deep of exactly what everything on this table means. I don't still quite remember everything. But essentially the way to read this is it says the read function, so actually let's look at this. Um, okay, actually I want to I wish I had this example. All right, I can't have this example. All right. We are going to, I'm going to do a live demo, which is definitely going to work. And let's see. Teaching. Oh, everyone wants to hear that. Okay. Uh, code. So this is the disassembly of that compiled program, the format symbol. And what is G for? Uh, it's because I'm running on the Mac, oh. and I believe the original object dump it has is for like mock binaries or something. You have to install GNU object dump, so that's what the G stands for. So I think it's the homebrew thing that I'm using. I thought it's a trick to no, make, uh, make no it tricks. No tricks. Because everything that you can do on the server, I promise. Um, okay, so if we look, so we, we can go to the C code and we can see that, let's say there's this call to F printf. So if we look at this assembly and we see where is this call printf, we can see that inside the add log function, right, you're getting very good at looking at disassembly code now, it's almost <laughs> becoming to be a second language to you. I understand and sympathize. So we're calling this function, but when we look, the call is call 80483BC, which doesn't really jive with what I just told you when I said that the library is dynamically loaded. So does the loader know to put the printf function, f printf function at 80483BC? That'd be a little bit brittle, what if printf change? What if there's not space for that? What if something is already allocated there? So what is actually there, if we look, there's actually, so the, it's, there's a section of the ELF header, if you look at the PLT, I believe it's the process linking table. Essentially what it does, so what's the very first instruction here? So what's this instruction? The instruction at 804.83bc says jump star hex 804.97e0. What is that? The jump to that address? Dereference that memory location. So take those four bytes that are at 804.97.e0 
and jump to them and start executing. So, uh, is it G? Ah, it is G read help. Okay, good. What did I say that magic command was? Is it reloads? Yeah. So, I believe this is the exact same code as the binary that I took this from. So, if we look at the relocation table, we can see that f printf, the, so these are the global offset table at f printf at 080497E0, which was exactly where we saw that it's jumping to. That's in the global offset table, which means which means essentially, so at runtime, what's going to happen here is at first there'll be a dummy address in there that actually calls into the dynamic linker and says link me into lib c of the f printf function and put the result at 80497E0. And then the next time it calls at 80497E0 will be the memory address, the f printf function. Is awesome. And we can see it's exactly so. This, when we talked about ways to divert control flow, we talked about a return function implicitly returns control to whatever the stack pointer is currently pointing to. Every time you call one of these dynamically linked functions, it's fetching whatever is at the global offset table at that memory location and jumping to that. So if you can change the value that's inside memory location 80497E0, that will be jumped to when there's a call to F print F. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. The question is, so looking back at this, so looking back at the C code, what function would you like to overwrite? Let's say you could overwrite any function, any libc function, right? So you can't overwrite add log or main. What would you overwrite? Yeah. F close. Why F close? Because it's after add log and. Um, yeah. Why not F open? It's well, the exploit happens after. Exactly, the overwrite happens after. So if you think about, is it ever possible for f open to be called after this f printf in this program? Is there any possible execution path where that can happen? No, it's fundamentally impossible. Right, so that would be, even if we could completely change the value in f open's global offset table, it gets us literally nothing. But, if we change f close, right, that gets executed immediately after add log, right? So inside add log, we have this while loop, we have an f printf, printing out f in the line, and then add log returns. The only other function that gets executed is this f close function. So that's the function we want to target. And so how do we go about doing this? Well, we can look exactly what I showed you here. So the code, again, for fclose in the PLT, in the process linking table, it's at 080497D8. So that's our target. If we can change those four bytes in, what is this, 080497D8, then we will be able to redirect the control flow to wherever we want. And so if we can put the address of our shell code there, we've got everything we need. And it's really that simple, except for all the pieces to do that. So, <laughs> so uh, we can first, so we have a percent P times eight. We know the second argument gets us to our first A, 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 A. So we can replace that with, this is why we looked at all those esoteric print that things of how to do exactly a positional argument. So here, if we do percent two dollar sign P, and why did I have to put a slash before this percent, before this dollar sign? Yeah, escaping it in bash, so protecting it from bash. So to Python, it gets a percent two dollar sign P, 
and that's what we want to pass into the program. So if we out, so what should this input that we're passing to the program do? It should print. Uh, no. So this is really important. This is part of the scientific process of how you go about explaining these things. You think, okay, I want to give some input. Based on my knowledge of the program, what should the output be? You want to do that before you run it, of just like throwing random stuff to see what happens. And then you get a result and you update your mental model to say whether that was correct or not. So what's the output going to be? So it's going to do the four A's, the four B's, the four C's, and the four D's. And because we change it to the second positional argument, and we know based on our previous experiment that the second positional argument is where our A's are, it's going to be hex 41, 41, 41, 41. So let's say we wanted to, so now that we've verified this, right? So now what, and now we know if we change that P to an N, and it should crash the program, right? Because we're trying to, right to 41, 41, 41. Now, what if we, so, uh, one thing, so what we want to do, and anytime you're doing these kind of things, you want to build it up into steps, right? So, gonna, so right now, now, we want to be able to, eventually we want to overwrite that value that we just looked at, the uh, 080497D8. This is the thing that we want to overwrite. So now we want to change all of those A's to 0804 97 D8. So how do we change these four A's to do that? Yes, hexadecimal in reverse order, right? This is why you guys have to do actual buffer overflows and stuff. So it's D8 97 04 08. So it's going to be so if we do that and we change the, we'll change the P to an X just to print it out in hex. So why are we doing this step? To make sure we get it right. Yeah, to make sure we get it right. To make sure that we put the address in correctly because the, the X is gonna interpret it, that value as hex and it's gonna print this out and it should print this out again. It won't print out four A's this time. It's gonna print out D8970408 and then four B's, four C's, four D's, and then it should print out um, 080497D8. So that's what we're thinking is gonna happen. And we do this, we see that's exactly what happens. So this is the garbage values that it's printing out of the address. And then 80497D8. So then, what do we think if we change that P in the format string to an N? What's gonna happen? 16 bytes to that address. It's going to write, yeah, it'll write, six, it'll change the value of the global offset table to 16. So what should happen? So should we get a seg fault in, print, in F printf? No. Why not? Because it's still within the character buffer, right? Exactly. And, we're, and if we looked at the ELF header section, we could see that this memory address is writable in this program. So we can write to that memory address and change that value. So there's an important distinction. It will crash, but it should not crash in fprintf because it's trying to access illegal memory. It should crash when it calls fprintf.
why didn't this crash? All right, good. Oh, it does crash, okay, good. Why does that say that here? All right, All right. but now we can test it, so you can, this is trying to help you get used to doing this. So we can put our output to a file, use GDB, run it with the input test, we can see that we get a set fault, and we can see that the error here, the EIP is hex 10, which is what? 16, which is the value that we wrote with the percent n into the GOT table, which when f printf was called became EIP. So here now we have our goal of we're changing EIP to what we want, but we don't want it to be 16. What do we want it to be? Address of shellcode. Yeah, the address of our shellcode, right? So, but what are some of the addresses roughly of some shellcode that you're using? FFFFD, I don't know, zero zero or something, right? <laughs> so is that a large value or a small value? It's a large, it's a very large value. It's so large it's negative probably, right? If uh, it's an unsigned integer. And so how do we get this 16? The number of bytes written. Yeah, so this was the amount of bytes that were written out. So why don't you write out F F F F F F D E D zero zero bytes? Hmm? I can't hear. Field width. Field width. Yeah, we're not there. But why can't why why can't can we do that? I mean, we we saw the field width. Yeah. So there's a way that we can control the output. So why don't we say, hey, print out a field width here. Before the percent n of hex ff 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 d zero whatever the address of our shellcode is minus sixteen because we already wrote out sixteen bytes for those first uh, the a's the b's the c's and the d's. Yes. Is it possible to add more characters in between the payload to handle uh, using the percent h and I think we can remove it correctly. Well, I'm asking what would happen if you did that. Can you do that? Yeah. Your buffer set up is interesting. You know, like the, I thought you had a buffer of 65. I do, but who's doing the writing? So let's say, so we saw there's a way to zero pad or to space pad a number. And you can actually put an arbitrary number there. So why not say, hey, output me a number that has F F F F F F E zero one trailing spaces or leading spaces. So it's not. So if we go here, it's not going to overflow our buffer because there's nothing to do. Our format string still exists in that same buffer. It's only added some characters to do this. How big is temp log going to be if we do that? Where are those bytes going that we're printing out? We're calling it fprintf, not printf. So where are they going? The file. Into the file, exactly. So this would mean that we would need to print out ff, ff. Let's just, uh, let's get the calculator so we can see. We'll say something like this, ff, ff, ffd01. Uh, that is, uh, let's see, yes, a very big number. What is it, 4.2, <laughs> is it billion or trillion or, I don't know, it's a very large number. And you think about this many bytes, so you can, somebody could Google this, how many bytes is this in gigabytes, it's going to be a lot, right, just for one attempt. So you actually, but if there's enough storage space, you can do that. Um, but it's not advisable because of all the problems that we just talked about, right? It's really hard to test something that takes multiple four gigabytes of data for every test you want to take. Um, but we saw, so the thing is when we do the percent to dollar sign n, how many bytes are we overwriting? What was the value in the IP in the global octet table? It was a four byte address, right? Four byte address. There's got to be four bytes in there, which means we must have overwritten it with 00016. Right? So we changed four bytes equal.
because the percent %n, when you use it in a printf, we saw it takes in a parameter of an int star. So it's going to write out an integer, which is four bytes. But that's a lot of bytes to control, right? Four bytes. But we saw that there are length modifiers. We can use hh to write out as the number of characters a character to a character pointer to just change a single byte. So the so the field width. So with this one, we percent two hundred x. We'll pad whatever that value is with two hundred space characters. So that's already what we talked about of the percent. Uh, the field width that we talked about. So you can put, you know, whatever, you can put four, 49 billion or whatever, and we'll actually do it. I've kind of done that before and it's super weird, but it kind of works. Um, yeah, so if our, okay, good, I already had this in here. See, look at this is what you do, math in advance, not in front of the class. <laughs> so if our shell code is at, let's say, FF, FFCA, F5, that's 4.2 gigabytes of data. Uh, you could actually do this and this would work, but we don't want to do that. So what we want to do, since we know we can use hhn, percent hhn, to write out a single byte of the values that we've written so far, we can just write each byte of f printf, changing in between there the number of characters we've written so far. And we'll see printf is very nice in that it overflows. So it keeps track of the number of integers, but when we only write the number of a HHN, it's only the least significant bytes of characters that we've written so far. So we can easily do this. So we can, so now we need to do math, and this is where everything is very precise because we need to write the exact number of bytes, but we control how many bytes are written. It doesn't change based on the program's execution. So we already know that 16 bytes were written so far. So how many, so we need some kind of percent something x of number of characters to output to get us to something that ends in ff. Because that's the first byte we want to write out. So then what do we, how many, what's that percent something x? 65,920. Wait, say it again? 255 minus 60. Yeah, FF minus 60. So because we only need one byte, right? So we only need, so we've already had 16 bytes. So if you think about, put yourself in printf shoes, you're keeping track of how many bytes have been output, right? Right before this percent n, we know 16 bytes have been output, but we really want that value to be ff. So we need to go from 16 to ff. We take that difference, which is ef. We convert that into decimal, and we get 239. So if we do a percent 239 x, or whatever, I don't think, it, in this case, it doesn't matter too much, and then the percent Two dollar sign H H N, the small character N, we will change a single byte to be F F. So let's look at this. So we have 080497 D8, B's, C's, D's, percent 239. So now when printf is going through, right, you have to put yourself in the mind of the printf function. When you get to the percent two dollar sign HHN, there should be 255 bytes that have been output at that point, yes. And you will write that to the second positional argument, which is the memory address 804.97.d8. This was right to the least significant byte, right? You tell me. So what do we expect to have happen? All the zeros and Yeah, so we're going to change, well, this is part of the problem, is we're going to change one of the bytes, the byte that is at address 804.97.d8 to ff. So we will probably cause a crash here. I mean, if we're changing a byte, right? Because it used to jump to f close, but now it's going to jump to some random thing. So we can GDB run it, we'll get a signal illegal instruction, so we'll see that it actually, 
received an illegal instruction at 804.83 FF. So we see that we actually overwrote the least significant byte. So which one's then the most significant byte? What's the memory address of the most significant byte? 8B. 8B? D8 plus 3. I don't know. Hex math is weird. Yeah, is it? DB? OK, I believe you. So if we change that to DB, then we should change we should be able to run this exact same thing and see that the error is illegal instruction, or actually it won't, won't say illegal instruction, it'll be a seg fault because it tried to fetch FF0483 FF or whatever this least significant byte was. So yeah. So now we can you can see that we've changed FF0483A2. And so now and basically, we can just build up this process, and we want to eventually write out FFFFCAF5, right? So we actually have something very nice. We, we can write out FF, and do we need to output any more characters? Yeah, because we rolled over. Now. No, because we're already at FF, and if we output any more, we'll roll over. So the next one can be, but which positional argument do we want to go to? Three, which is going to be the four B's that we have. So this is why we started with doing four A's, four B's, four C's, four D's, because we're going to change four bytes in the program, and we're going to need four memory locations, four memory addresses on the stack in order to do that. So if you're super clever or feeling very uh, crazy, you can order these writes in a way that you never have to overflow. You can only increase. That's weird. Um, I mean, you can totally do that, but you'll just have to be like, okay, this one is, is this byte and this byte, and you're writing it over bytes. Anyways, I just do it byte by byte and not worry about it too much. Um, so we can do that here. So now we can change the second. So all of the Bs we can change to 080497DA, which is going to be the second most significant byte because it's one less than the most significant byte that we just calculated at db so this is at da and we have now a percent hhn sorry percent three dollar sign hhn so get the third positional argument which we know is all of the b's and write out to that in a, at to that byte and if we do that we see that we change the address to ff ffba 4b and then we change the C's. So we need to output from FF to CA for the next byte. So how many, how many characters do we now need to output with a percent something X? So it's going to wrap around, right? So we need one more to wrap us around to essentially you can think of the internal counter will be 0, 1, 0, 0. So if you wrote that out of the character as the, as the number of bytes, it would just tell you 0, 0. So from there, we need to increment that to CA. So we'll need C1 plus CA, which is 203. So then we can change this to after our percent three dollar sign HHN percent 203 X and then a percent now we're getting the fourth positional argument because this is going to be the all of the C's 080497 D9 and actually when I ran this it worked why Ops. yes because I had a big not sled right so the value that was already in there which we actually know from this page the value of 4B just happened to be inside my NOP sled. So FF, FF, what was my target? Uh, yeah. yeah. Instead of F5, whatever that happened to be pointed to my shell code, and it just worked. Yeah. Can you show us where the, the, the shell code is? No. That's part of it. So assume it's there. You already know how to inject. Through all the other stuff, you're then going to inject shellcode into things and okay. find out the addresses of the shellcode. 
episode. So, Got it. so using this technique, right? This is what I mentioned with the scalpel, right? You're changing four bytes in the program and are completely changing the execution here and diverting the control flow. So pretty cool. And if you, I mean, you won't have to do this here, but in many cases, uh, you may have to use a printf vulnerability, like we mentioned, to leak data. So you can actually, because uh, you may not know their, the memory layout may be random every time it's run or whatever, but if you can leak a pointer through printf, right, because you can print values off the stack, then you can use that to calculate the offset of whatever you want, and then you can know what values to write. But anyways, very cool, I like it. Um, and this isn't a, this vulnerability actually comes up in a lot of real world software a lot of the time. Um, so there was a, this is great, um, this locale program, uh, you could pass in a value that it would do the similar thing of writing to a log or whatever the input that you pass to it with at printf and it would trigger a buffer overflow, or a format strike vulnerability. So what, how do we prevent this? So we're writing software. We want to use print apps. Do, we, do I scare you away from ever using print apps? <laughs> Maybe now that you realize the true complexity of this beast that you're using, it's much more complicated than you thought, but it is nice to print out numbers and stuff. <laughs> so you want to still use it, how do you do that? Don't let the user specify the... Never let the user specify the format string. Does this mean you can never have user input that's output from a printf? Use percent %s. Yes, use a percent %s. A percent %s you can pass in as a parameter the character pointer of the user's input. Although you will need to be careful that you null terminate their input. Because it is possible, printf will keep printing out bytes until it hits a percent zero. Or, sorry, not a percent zero, but a null byte. So it's actually possible sometimes to leak data from the program, like a password or something, if you can create a buffer that's not null terminated. So you do need to be careful, but fundamentally, you will completely prevent printf vulnerabilities if you never. Always constant strings. Like, think about a printf. If you look at it, it's got to have a constant string. No user input. Yeah, so printf buff bad, printf percent s buff good. <laughs> All right. Even if you're passing parameters, this is another trick, right? This is what we saw. Even if you're passing parameters as part of the format string, if they can control the buffer and the format string, they can clearly keep getting values on there. Cool, okay. So now we start to level up the protection mechanism. So we looked at various types of memory corruption and ways that an adversary can arbitrarily change memory in our program. Uh, so prevention is easy, just write better code. <laughs> and I think I, you know, in the early history of security, I think people honestly believed that they could do this, that you, you just teach people, you train them about all these vulnerabilities, all these problems, and magically everything goes away and gets fixed. It gets, and is fixed. Um, why do I believe this is impossible? And do you agree? Yeah. Sometimes you don't write the code, sometimes you write in a, in a programmer or a tool writes it. Right. Yeah, think about the code. Think about any piece. I, I, this is a pretty good challenge. Think about any piece of code that you've written in the last, I don't know, five or ten years. Did you write every single line of code that was executed as part of that? Does anyone think that they did? No. Yeah, so even if you wrote every single line of code in your C code or your C or whatever, or your Java code, you didn't write the JVM that's interpreting your Java bytecode. You didn't, even if you wrote the C code, you didn't 
write all of the function calls in the kernel that the application is calling into. If you're using networking, you didn't write any of the, that code. Even if you wrote it in assembler and you didn't even rely on a compiler to compile it, you still have all those abstraction layers that are written by other people. And then who wants to write stuff from scratch? You're much more likely to implement the vulnerability yourself when you're writing a library than if you use a well-tested library. But that still doesn't preclude some kind of vulnerability in that library. So it's pretty much impossible to do this, I, I will say. Um, you can prevent some memory corruption by, you know, Using a language like Python. Like, do you have to worry about buffer overflows in Python or in Java? No, because the language takes care of that. Takes care of that. But, like I mentioned, your interpreter is written in C, and so you can still have memory corruption vulnerabilities. So, for instance, JavaScript. Can you have a buffer overflow in JavaScript? People who program JavaScript? No, it's fundamentally impossible. The language does not allow you to do that. However, it's still possible for you to have a browser, visit a website, and download JavaScript that takes advantage of a vulnerability in the JavaScript engine, which is written in C, to leak values and to, um, a, it's probably more heap style vulnerabilities and other kinds of stuff. But anyway, they can get arbitrary code execution in your browser from JavaScript code that you download. And this happens all the time. Just check any CVEs related to uh, uh, related to browsers. Uh, you can try performing static analysis. You can try analyzing these things to try to see, develop a program that will tell you if something has a vulnerability or not. What's the so? Actually, I will. So the key problem, though, is uh, you've heard of the halting problem. Hopefully, graduate. Quickly Google it on your phone later. Uh, halting problem means that it's impossible. Well, I mean, there's various definitions, but essentially it means it's possible to write a program that can tell if another program halts or terminates on a given input. Uh, it turns out that statically analyzing a piece of code for all memory corruption vulnerabilities is equivalent to the halting problem, in that if you can write that checker, you can use that to solve the halting problem, which means you cannot write a perfect static analysis tool that can find all vulnerabilities in your program and never make any mistakes. Ugh, it's so depressing. Uh, you can make exploitation harder, and that's really the, I mean, it's kind of a security, uh, kind of a defense in depth strategy where you just make, so one of the things we talked about is we've been seeing that you know the address, why do you know the address of your shell code? Set the stack at a different location. 
which makes your job harder because now you need to know where you go to for shell code. Uh, we can try detecting when these things happen. So this is more the intrusion detection approach. Uh, we could try finding out if our program is under attack. Turns out there's a lot of research done on this. It's very difficult. Very, very difficult. But in the exploitation harder, making exploitation harder, this was the approach. And it became essentially a cat and mouse game between attackers and defenders, where attackers developed remote buffer overflows that wrote shell code on the stack and started executing it. And so defenders came up with new techniques about, aha, what if we change the address of the stack every time the program executes? Um, another one is, why does the stack need to be executable at all? Are there programs that need to execute uh, things on the stack? What? Library calls. Library calls? Uh, library calls are loaded into a code segment in memory, so they'll get their own executable code segment, just like your program does. But they don't have it on their own stack, they share it with you. Interpreters? Interpreters, Ooh, why would they need to do that? Because the runtime might be used in construction. Yeah, so uh, interpreters like the JVM, Right, interpreted by a bytecode, and when it detects a hotspot, it compiles that to native code, x86 code, and executes it. Where does it do that? Right, it has to dynamically create code. Where does that code come from? It has to be in memory somewhere, either on the stack or on the heap, and it needs to be executable. So there actually are programs that need executable stacks, but nine times out of ten, most programs do not. So this was. This was kind of an easy technique of just, hey, let's stop making the stack executable. Nobody really needs that. And if you need that, you can change the compiler flag to allow that. So this is called NX, where um, you're either, or it's also called a writable or uh, XOR executable. So a page in memory can be either writable or it can be executable, but it can never be both at the same time. And this actually is, um, so the NX bit marks memory areas as non-executable. So this way you can say that, hey, the stack region is not executable. This way, if you tried to jump the shell code on the stack, what happens? Yeah, it's say, it says, sorry, this, just like a seg fault, right? Trying to access memory that's not allocated. If you try to write to memory that's not writable, like the text segment, you get a seg fault. So, all different kinds of names for this because people, you know, this is what happens when you develop technologies. DEP is Microsoft's name. NX, there's WXOR X, um, writable or executable. Um, so the idea is you never have memory at the same time, but like we just talked about, applications may either need the stack to be executable or they may allocate a page of memory and make it writable write x86 code to it, and then change it to executable and start executing it, which is exactly what a JIT interpreter does. And this is exactly how exploits against JVMs and browsers work, is they take advantage of this functionality. So it still doesn't prevent, protect anything even here. And so, I don't know, I should probably at some point, I think somebody needs to do like a software security history and look at like, how long these timelines take between you develop this defensive feature. And you think, like, this involves a lot of work. You have to change the kernel, you have to change hardware features, you have to uh, all to support this functionality. It probably makes things slower because you're doing extra work that you weren't doing before. And so you're a bad guy, right? You still want to break things and hack things. You can, does this prevent you from overflowing buffers on the stack? What's the memory protections now in the stack? Can an application read values on the stack? Can they execute on the stack? Can they write? Yeah. So EIP, EDP, or both saves still on the stack. You can 
It'll ramp up and overflow and overflow those values. The question is, what are you going to redirect the control flow to? Any ideas? Yes. We've now jumped into the future. We've taken a step forward into the future. The stack is now not executable. We still have upper overflows. Repeat the libc function. Why? Because if you pass the parameters, it executes on its own stack. Yeah, so the general idea is, well, hey, so think about it. What were we doing with shellcode? What was the point of our shellcode? Right, so we wanted to call exec, uh, exec DE with the proper parameters of NSH. But well, why do we have to, I mean, why do we have to inject it into the process? So that it directly executes uh, as, as it is getting read from the stack. Yeah, so it's, you can think of it like we're trying to put our own instructions into the program, right? Our own x86 instructions into program's memory, and we want it to start executing there. We can still divert control flow because we can control EIPs and EVPs on the stack. We just can't directly inject instructions, but have you looked at how big programs are? There's a heck of a lot of code that is executable in a program, right? All of their te that text segment is executable. And the libraries that get loaded into the program are also executable. And libraries contain great functions such as system, right? If we can call system slash nsh, that gets us exactly what we want. Or we can call popen, or we can, we, you know, maybe we can even do system cap the file out or something. We don't even need that. So um, the first kind of iteration of this idea was this returning to live C. So the idea that we can when our function returns, rather than, so remember, when we control the stack, we control the save DIP, which controls where this function returns to. And so fundamentally, there's a lot of fun functions in libc, so why not return to those functions and have them do what we want them to do? All right. So. So let's diagram this. Well, actually, let's get to code first, and then we'll diagram it. So we can basically call, so if we think about this jumping, so we can actually call, we can put the address, and we saw that the text segment of the program doesn't change. Right? The memory locations are more or less fixed. So we can actually jump to any function that the program has itself. So if there's an admin functionality or a function that says give us a flag, we can just jump to that, right? Otherwise, we can maybe jump into any of the libc functions. So we can jump into system. We can even do complicated things. So there's libc calls to change the memory protections of various pages. We can actually jump to a function to make the shell code, our stack executable, and then jump to that. Or maybe not the stack, maybe some other data section. Um, now the difficulty is, so now we just need to know the address of system. Where is system loaded by the loader into our program's memory? So we can look, so let's look at a program. So we have uh, include string.h, we have int main, a character buffer of size 50, String copy of argv1 onto foo, and then return 10. So main, we have a standard push EVP, move the stack pointer into EVP, subtract 3c from ESP, move EVP plus c into EAX, add 4 to EAX, dereference EAX, move that into EAX, move EAX onto ESP plus 4, Load effective address EBP minus 32 EAX. What this load effective address EBP minus 32 EAX doing? Yeah, so this is uh, our buffer foo, right? Because it's moving that from EAX onto the stack. So it's setting up all of the parameters to call string copy. 
and then it's going to call string copy. And what is this actually calling? So it's calling 804.82.d0. Is this where sort of string copy is going to be loaded? Yeah. What is it? That's our PLT, I forgot they used the word earlier, trampoline, that's the other way they used to call it. It's just a little bit of code that grabs the value from the global offset table and jumps to it. So it's going to jump to the PLT trampoline for uh, string copy. And then move 10 into EAX, leave return. Right? Pretty simple. So we can do this. If you look very closely at these options, we got rid of the dash executable stack option, which is good. Right? We're getting rid of more and more of these protection mechanisms. It's the dash FBO stack protector. We'll get to there later. So if we think of what we want, and it all comes back to drawing the stack. So this is again why I keep harping on that. Okay, so we can draw the stack pointer. So main is about to main is executing. So EBP points to here. What does EBP currently point to on the stack for main? Actually, I need more room. What does EBP point to when main is executing? Let's say, like right before this call to string copy. Save DBP, right? Save DBP above that. Save EIP above that. ArcC above that. Argv pointer pointer above that. Yeah, in ENVP, the environment pointer, even though we don't use it, it always is passed to main anyways. All right, then we're at this call instruction of call string copy. So how far down from the EBP is the stack pointer? Right here, this right before this call, 80482d0. Fifty. I mean, you could say it in hex. It's acceptable. When you all whisper, it's really difficult to even hear if you're close to being correct, <laughs> which is probably. Third, what was it? Minus 32. Minus 32? No. Hex 3C. Hex 3C, yes. It's this option. So you'd have to go through all of them to see that we're not actually changing the stack pointer except for that location right there. Right? So we're subtracting 3C from ESP after we move the stack pointer into the base pointer. So the distance between EBP and ESP should be hex 3C. Which just for you know fun is what is it? Sixty. Okay, cool. Yes. So sixty bytes between those two, and then what is directly at ESP? What's on the stack of ESP? Yes. Address of the buffer. Address of the buffer. So where's the buffer at? Where on the stack? Fifty bytes, so thirty-two hex below EBP. Which is ten bytes. Which is ten bytes above ESP, but we know so we can point to what's called foo. So we know that between EBP and foo there's fifty bytes. And I mean we could continue drawing this stack. This is the address of foo, and this is uh, RV1 which is a character pointer, so that's going to point somewhere up here. And so when we do that, so then once we call string copy, when now argv1 is now copied onto the buffer, how many bytes from the starting buffer to the same base pointer? So you're trying to overflow this, right? So how many bytes do you need to reach the same DVD? Same DVD. Fifty. We'll say fifty. Fifty-one is you will overwrite the first byte of EBP. But fundamentally, you need 
let's say 50 A's to fill up all of the 50 bytes between foo and EBP on the stack. And we know this specifically because it's load effective address EBP minus 32 into EAX and pushing that on the stack. So it's, that is what tells us, not the C code. The C code is actually this option of M preferred stack count read equals two means that it doesn't add a lot of padding to the stack. So it's gonna be almost precisely what we have. Um, so 50 bytes will get us right to EBP. The next four bytes will overwrite saved EBP. The next four bytes will overwrite saved EIP. All good? This is all normal stuff? Repeat that one more time? Yes. So we know from looking at the assembly code that foo compiled into load effective address EBP minus 32 hex, so which is 50. So we know that there's 50 bytes between where foo is to the start of the save EBP on the stack. So we need so if we wanted to, let's say, control EIP, we first need 50 A's to get fill up the stack from foo right before the save EBP. We need, let's say, four B's to overflow and change save EBP. And then the next four bytes of our of our argv1 will overflow save EIP. Alright, this is just the first part. So but our goal now is, so now, before we used to put the address of our shell code and overwrote save the IP with that. Can we do that anymore? No, we can't do that anymore, right? Because we can't execute on the stack. We will get a overflow. But what we really want to do is try to call what? System. System. We want to really want to call system. So let's say, so we overflow with 50 A's, four B's, and then we'll say, we'll see how to find the address of system. Are we done? No. Why? We need to push what we're gonna call system. Yeah, okay. We need to actually put onto the stack the arguments of system. So now we need to, okay, so this is what gets kind of tricky because you need to think about the stack in two different ways. There's what we're overflowing and what was currently there. And then now we need to think about this. So now, after this call a string copy, right, we've overflown the stack, we've clobbered 50 bytes, we've clobbered save EBP, we've placed the address of system on save EIP. Now we move 10 into EAX, we do a leave and then a return. So a leave is going to move the stack back up to ESP will point here, EBP will now be whatever value we clobbered onto the stack, let's say four Bs, and then a return, and I'm just gonna go over this, and then the return will then pop four more bytes off the stack, and now the EIP will be the address of system. So, from, and we've done this many times, so this is not new. So from system's perspective, right, if you are the system function, you just get called with the stack pointer here. What is, so right, the very first byte of system, what does it think is currently at the stack pointer? Yes, the saved EIP of whoever called it. And then what's the first thing that the prolog of every function does? Yeah, push, push EBP, which moves the stack pointer down. ESP then sets up the new base pointer to point there, so EBP will point to here. And then it will subtract whatever space. Now, when it tries to access, so system takes how many arguments? One, right? How is it going to address, where is it going to try and find that first argument? EBP plus, EBP plus what? 
8. Oh. EBP plus 8. Always 8, right? That's any function, right? It doesn't matter. So EBP plus 8 will be here. So this is, what is, uh, what's it called? Uh, command? So if we want to properly set up, so if we want to properly set up a overflow to properly return to libc, we need to construct this fake function frame specifically for system or whatever function we're calling. So we need to first get to with our overflow to the saved EIP. We overflow saved EIP with the address of system. And then what are the next four bytes? Save the IP of wherever we want system to go to whenever it's done executing. So if we don't care where system goes, because we want to call system bin sh and just get a shell, then we can put junk there. We'll actually see we can get more advanced by actually chaining function calls. So when system returns, it goes to another function that we choose, and that goes to another function, all with parameters that we choose. So we can basically create a whole series of fake system of, not system, but fake function calls to do whatever we want. But that has to be done very precisely, which clearly we'll get to on Monday. But, so we overwrite, so we overwrite the address of system, we overwrite four bytes with the fake save the IP of system, and then what are the next four bytes? Yeah, so then we have to do four bytes that point to the string bin sh. So we need to then, because that's the character pointer of command, right? Because, so when we think about it, so you have to kind of overlay these two stacks, right? You're trying to make the stack on the right of save the IP and then command. But, because that's what system thinks should be in its function frame. And then if we go back to the slides, so we can. What were the second four bytes again? The second four bytes, so the address of system, then the next four bytes are the saved EIP of wherever system returns to. So that's when system calls ret, that's where it's going to go execute next. And then the four bytes above that, we want to point to the string bin sh. Um, so we can look at this example, we can do read elf to look at the um, stack, and we can see that the stack is readable writable, so there's no executable stack. So, this is if you run this command on the programs on the server, you'll see that the stacks are executable because that's how we're, we're learning how to do those. Um, we can GDB this, we can breakpoint, we can run it, and we can print out the address of system so that when we run this, we can see that systems at B7E6 6310. We can then do, uh, we can cat out the proc memory. So we can use the proc memory maps to see, well, this is actually what we looked at before, but we can do that to look at this process that's being begun and figure out where uh, libc-2.19.so is the libc binary, where that is. And we can see that the executable memory so there's one memory page in here that's readable and executable. So the address of system is inside there. And super cool thing. So when you call system, we actually did this for your very first project for doing the web service. What are the semantics of system? It, it executes your command exactly how. With bin sh dash c and then your command, which means that inside of the libc library there must be the string bin sh. So you don't even need to bring your own bin sh because it already exists inside of system because it must. I mean, not inside of system, inside of libc because it must exist. So we can actually reuse that. So we can. Um, so this is gdb as a super cool find command. So you can look through memory to find values. 
So this is looking at, and we'll know that it's not going to be in the executable memory segment. It'll be in the read-only memory segment, because that is a constant string that should never change. So we can look inside B726, uh, E26000, which, just so that I'm not super full of it, should be within this range. And we'll find that bin sh is at B7F8684C. So now we can actually have everything we need in order to write our, our command. We know we can do 50 A's to overflow that buffer to get to say BDP, four B's to overflow say BDP. We can put the address of system, which we now have here. We can then put four more junk bytes, which are going to be where system goes when it returns. And then right above that, we have the address of bin SH. We can put B7F8684C. And if we run that, so 50 A's, BCDE for say BBP, uh, the address of system, oh, this is clearly an example that is to show you that that doesn't work. So why doesn't this work very quickly before we leave? What are we missing? Yeah, we're missing the four bytes of the saved EIP that system thinks is there. In between the address of system and the argument to system, we need four bytes there. So when you do this, you'll see that this actually uh, will work, but when we get to system and it does push EBP and it tries to access it, it's gonna try to access the string bin SH from whatever was on the stack, which is garbage, which is not bin SH. Um, so if you do this, you'll get a super weird error. Where it'll say sh syntax error eof and backquote, which is super weird to debug, and that's why you need to look at it and really understand how system is expecting the stack to look. But when you figure that out and you do it correctly, and you add some four junk bytes of where the save eip of systems, where system will go and it's done executing, if you do that you will then get your awesome shell. So you'll have called bin sh with slash, you'll call system with slash bin slash sh. And so the other thing is the only memory regions we use are the memory regions of where bin sh is loaded. So we're not using the stack at all. We're reusing code that already exists in bin sh. Yes? Are we guaranteed that the is going to be No, because that's of course the next thing that they do is then they say, well, of course, then let's not load the library. So when we get to ASLR on Monday, we'll talk about that, is they'll say, hey, let's move it around. So uh, there's tricks around that. So usually you need to read, so you can read something from the GOT and then calculate all your offsets. Oh, so formulate your own memory map. Exactly, yeah. So as long as you know where it's loaded, you'll know.